Welcome everyone and thank you for attending the latest in a series of public events in 2021 by the Michael V. Hayden Center for Intelligence Policy and International Security. I am Mark Rozelle. I serve as the Dean of the Shar School of Policy and Government at George Mason University. And we are very proud to host the Hayden Center. This event is the first of the academic calendar year for the Hayden Center. And you can look forward to many more over the next several months. Tonight, we have over 600 persons signed up from all over the United States and internationally. Uh, participants tonight are from 37 states, District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, as well as 26 countries on six, six continents, uh, and also from 40 colleges and universities. So welcome all. The Hayden Center is part of a larger security studies emphasis in the Shar School of Policy and Government. We have as well the Center for Security Policy Studies directed by Professor Ellen Leipson, who also directs our International Security Studies Master's Degree Program. And that has been a top 10 program nationally ranked for four years running in US News and World Report rankings. And we are fortunate to have many leading scholars and practitioner teachers in our International Security Studies Master's Degree Program. Related to that, is our unique program in biodefense studies. And given its an emphasis on infectious diseases and public policies to combat those, you can imagine that interest in that program has grown very substantially. Additionally, we have a generous gift from the Diana Davis Spencer Foundation supporting scholarships for Shar School students in security studies fields, such as the two degree programs that I just mentioned. And the Hayden Center, of course, honors its founder, General Michael V. Hayden, who has been on our faculty at George Mason University now for 11 years. So I have the distinct honor now of inviting General Hayden himself to welcome you to tonight's program. General. Thank you again. It's really nice to be back, don't you think? Now, listening to what's going on in Afghanistan, the Taliban, and how about in our own government, the, the government, uh, the Congress, the White House, the Department of Defense, and so on. There's a lot going on. So let's go. Let's go. Thank you again. All right, General, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Larry Pfeiffer. I'm the director of the Hayden Center. And I'd like to welcome you to our uh, program of events here for our academic year, which just started uh, earlier this month. Uh, as Mark mentioned, the Hayden Center is part of the Shar School of uh, Policy and Government. Uh, the center was established by General Hayden back in uh, 2017. And our real primary purpose in life is to help demystify intelligence for folks out in the audience and the general public. Uh, we'd like to talk about uh, the role it plays in supporting policymakers and when it succeeds, when it fails, why it succeeds, why it fails. And that's uh, uh, frankly, what our event tonight is all about. Uh, we do this through large speaking events. They used to be largely in person. Uh, lately, we've been doing them virtually owing to the pandemic. We hope to hope to get back to having in-person events in the not too distant future. Uh, if you're interested in attending these events uh, and you want to get first notice, go to our website, haydencenter.gmu.edu. And over to the right-hand side, there's a box. You put your email address, hit subscribe, and you'll be amongst the first to know when we have a new event coming up. Uh, some just administrivia for you. Um, we have social media, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn accounts. You can find us out there very easily by searching for Hayden Center. Uh, we have a YouTube account uh, that all the events we do are recorded and stored there. Uh, search on YouTube for Hayden Center and you can find it. Some of you may be watching the live stream on, Hayden, uh, on the Hayden Center YouTube channel right now. Um, we're gonna do questions from the audience later on. Uh, Olivia, our moderator, will alert you when she'll start asking those questions, but feel free throughout the event to put questions into the Q&A box that's available in the Zoom tool. Uh, don't put your questions in the chat function. We're not gonna be looking at that too closely, but uh, use the Q&A box and uh, that's where we're gonna be uh, pulling our questions from. Uh, keep your questions brief, please make it a question. Um, if you'd like to be anonymous, there's a box you can check to remain anonymous. If you'd like us to identify who you are, uh, identify uh, your name, your affiliation, we'd be happy to put that out as we ask the question. Uh, as General Hayden mentioned, Afghanistan, big issue of the day. We probably couldn't uh, have picked a more timely topic given the hearings that took place on the Hill this week with the military commanders. 
uh, intelligence has played a major role in Afghanistan. Uh, you know, heck, going you know back to the 1980s when we were aiding the Afghan rebels uh, in trying to push the Soviet army out of Afghanistan, carrying it forward all the way through 9/11, the hunt for bin Laden, uh, the uh, takedown of the Taliban, the, the nation building that took place, etc. Uh, the big question being asked these days is: Did intelligence fail the policymaker and the warfighter? Uh, I think we're going to be looking at that pretty extensively tonight. Um, more importantly. How is intelligence pivoting to support continued efforts to keep our nation and our allies safe? Uh, I think many of us look at least in part uh, that what took place in Afghanistan uh, was successful and that we haven't had another attack in our country in 20 years like the attack on 9-11. Um, but uh, I, I think our, our expert panel tonight will be able to go into more detail there. Uh, these three have participated in the policy debate and the execution of that policy over the past 20 years. So I imagine they're gonna have an opinion or two about uh, more than just intelligence. Uh, we can't talk about Afghanistan without acknowledging the sacrifice made by many in the intelligence service, the US military, the diplomatic corps, uh, the corporate world, their families and loved ones over the past 20 years. Um, some made the ultimate sacrifice. We on this panel all have colleagues, friends, family who've, who've suffered losses and made sacrifices. And so we want to just take a brief moment and offer our thanks to those who've made the sacrifice uh, over the last 20 years. And, and I believe uh, that it was uh, not for nothing. It, it was for something. Introdu introducing our uh, panel members tonight, we have Olivia Gazas serving as our moderator. She is uh, from CBS News, their intelligence and national security reporter. And she's also a producer. She produces the Intelligence Matters podcast that is uh, hosted by Michael Morell. Um, she's been with CBS since 2011. And she has twice before served as a Hayden Center moderator. So I think she is breaking the record for uh, a non Hayden Center person being at a Hayden Center event. So congratulations, Olivia. Michael Morell, he is a former acting director and deputy director of CIA, CBS News national security contributor. He hosts the Intelligence Matter podcast. Uh, he's the author of a book called The Great War of Our Time The CIA's Fight Against Terrorism from Al Qaeda to ISIS. And he is a senior fellow here at the Hayden Center and a distinguished visiting professor at the Shar School. Mike Vickers, former Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence from 2011 to 2015. In that role, he exercised the Secretary of Defense's authority, direction, and control over all DOD and service uh, intelligence elements and agencies. Uh, prior to that, he served as the first and only Assistant Secretary for Special Operations, Low Intensity Conflict, and interdependent capabilities, probably took his entire business card up, just those words, uh, from 2007 to 2011. Um, in essence, he served as the service secretary for all special operation forces. Uh, in that time, he conceived, led, uh, conceived and led uh, the largest expansion of special operation forces uh, in, in US and frankly, modern military history. Um, before that, he served as a special operations soldier in his very early days of, of work. Uh, he was a, a CIA officer. Uh, some of you may recognize Mike's name from the book Charlie Wilson's War or the movie Charlie Wilson's War. Uh, Mike played a very prominent role in leading the covert effort to drive the Soviet army from Afghanistan. So of all of our panel members, Mike has probably been involved in Afghanistan for the longest period of time. And last but not least, we have Phil Riley. Phil is 29 year CIA veteran, former special operations officer, uh, he led, uh, before his retirement, CIA's Special Activities Division. That's the paramilitary arm of the agency. As General Hayden uh, liked to say, uh, the CIA of today is more like the OSS of World War II than it's ever been in its history. And that was uh, largely owing to the activities of that division. Uh, he also served as Chief of Operations at CIA's Counterterrorism Center. He held several overseas assignments, including Chief of Station in Kabul, from 2008 to 2009. And he was deputy commander of that first CIA team that entered Afghanistan just a mere two weeks after 9-11 and began the effort to that ultimately led to bringing down bin Laden uh, 10 years later. So with that, uh, thank you all for joining us. And I will pass it over to Olivia to get started. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Larry. Thank you, Dean Roselle and General Hayden uh, for those uh, introductions and for hosting another really important and really timely event with these remarkable panelists. I am delighted to be with you and to be with this engaged audience. I know you ask very smart questions, so please don't hesitate to submit those. 
As Larry made clear, each of our panelists has a really dimensional experience with Afghanistan, with its societal dynamics, and of course, with the history of US engagement there. So we'll structure today's conversation in three parts to cover a little bit of the past, just as baseline context, then focus more heavily, heavily on present and future challenges, uh, which I know are of particular interest. So we'll dive right, right in. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for being here uh, and welcome. Let's spend just a few minutes again on the past, starting at the final stages of the Cold War. And Mike Vickers, I will start with you. Uh, as Larry mentioned, you were an integral part of the CIA covert action program that supported the Mujahideen uh, and the anti-communist resistance movement, which ultimately drove the Soviets from Afghanistan. At the time, a very meaningful victory, but uh, uh, had some tragic consequences for Afghanistan, which descended into civil war, and for the United States, which ultimately witnessed uh, the horrors of 9-11. So can you start us off with just a little bit of context by explaining who the groups were that we were supporting at the time, what happened when we withdrew that support, uh, and how we arrived as a, at a, as a consequence at the birth of both the Taliban and Al-Qaeda? Sure, happy to, and, and good evening, Olivia and, and everyone else. Um, so I became the Afghanistan Covert Action Program Officer and Chief Strategist in summer of 1984. So I go back a long ways uh, with Afghanistan. And some of the people who were my resistance commanders, prominent commanders actually leading fighting forces in Afghanistan, ended up having very prominent positions in the Afghan government that I worked with when I became an assistant secretary and undersecretary. So I had a lot of continuity uh, over um, four decades. Um, what happened after we won this great historic victory that helped contribute to the, to the demise of the Soviet, Soviet empire um, was that we essentially turned our backs on Afghanistan and, and focused on uh, consolidating the gains in Europe, the primary theater of the Cold War with the reunification of Germany and liberation of Eastern Europe. And then a thing called the Pressler Amendment caused us to essentially break relations with Pakistan when their nuclear program got um, uh, too far along for President Bush to be able to certify that they weren't heading toward a nuclear weapon. And so that became that led to the time of troubles that, as you mentioned, a, a civil war occurred among Mujahideen fighters. The Pakistanis had their favorite, a fellow named Gulbuddin Hekmatyar. Um, and then in 1996, the Taliban took over and a lot of the Afghan population was just hoping for an end to um, decades of war at that point. They didn't get it. And then uh, in 1996, as Michael can talk about better than I, uh, bin Laden went from Sudan to Afghanistan, and then those events um, led to 9-11. I would argue that 9-11 was as much or more a policy failure as it was uh, an intelligence failure. Uh, we had opportunities to deal with that sanctuary. One of the things, one of the big lessons we learned from that experience was not allow sanctuaries after that. And so with that, I'll stop. Thank you. And, and Mike, we'll revisit a, ver a version of this question um, later, but while we're on you, I just want to ask, you've long said that the U.S. committed an error in at, at the end of the war, the Cold War, by disengaging from the region. And I wanted to ask if you still think now that continued U.S. engagement then might have prevented the Taliban from coming to power, and do the developments today make you reconsider that view? Um Yes, I think it's possible it would have. Um, you know, the circumstances were were quite difficult. The U.S. had a lot on its plate uh, at the end of the uh, Cold War, 1989 to 1992, before Afghanistan really descended into hell. Um, and so it might have made a real difference to stay engaged. The challenge would have been how to do that with an estranged U.S. relationship with Pakistan because of their nuclear weapons program. And so that's what would have reduced a lot of our leverage and complicated it, but we would have been far better off. I mean, my old boss, Bob Gates, says that it was one of the biggest mistakes we made um, after the Cold War to disengage. And, and you know, and I, I agree with him. Also, you know, the Afghans really played a major role in helping us um, win the end game of the Cold War. You know, a million of them died, a third of the population was put into exile. So to pick up and leave was maybe not the right moral as well as strategic decision. And, and today, I think we made a mistake as well by, by leaving completely. 
We'll definitely dive into that shortly. Um, Michael, just as a little bit more historic context, Michael Morell, I'll call you Michael and Mike Vickers, Mike. Um, so let's have you pick up the thread where uh, Mike left off. Uh, you know, in the early 90s, the CIA is, of course, watching Al Qaeda uh, gain potency. It's tracking the rise to prominence of uh, who was first cast as a terror financier, later cast as a terrorist, uh, Osama bin Laden, of course. Uh, it wasn't until the late 90s that the U.S.'s focus on Al Qaeda really expanded beyond the agency. You got more resources dedicated to tracking it. Can you talk a little bit, just a little bit, about what the conditions at that time were that allowed Al Qaeda to grow, to organize, and to become capable of, ca of carrying out these really complex attacks that culminated, of course, in 9 11? Sure. Um, first of all, it, it's great to be with everybody tonight. And Olivia, thank you for, um, for moderating. Um, you know, Mike said it earlier, um, and I'll say it maybe a little, a little more directly, there is nothing, there is nothing as important as safe haven to a terrorist group. Um, it allows them to operate, to plan, to train um, without worry, right, without consequence of, uh, of, of, of somebody coming after them. And that's what the Taliban um, in Afghanistan prior to 9-11 gave to Al Qaeda. Um, and I don't believe the 9-11 attacks would have been possible without the Taliban providing that, that safe haven. Um, interestingly, the Taliban was not supportive of um, Al Qaeda conducting attacks uh, around the world, um, but they didn't do anything in response to the attacks against our embassies in East Africa. They didn't do anything um, in response to the many threats um, around the time of the, the millennium. Um, that were pinned back on bin Laden and they didn't do anything in response to the USS Cole. Um, and, and in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, they had an opportunity. The United States gave the Taliban an opportunity to avoid war um, by turning bin Laden over um, or, or by taking action against him themselves. Um, and they chose not to do that. So, you know, that takes us from, from where Mike left off to, uh, to, uh, to the days after 9-11 which is where we'll have Phil, you jump in because we are having this conversation almost to the day when you and nine other men who made up the Jawbreaker team traveled to Afghanistan to meet up with the Northern Alliance. That was September 26, 2001. Um, and it was a liaison mission, uh, not a military operation, right? So can you give us just a little bit of background on what the mission was and how cultivating that relationship with the Northern Alliance factored in the US military effort that followed uh, and maybe a little bit about how it fa might factor today. Sure. Uh, thank you very much, Olivia and General Hayden. Thank you for your continued uh, leadership. Um, the CIA had a relationship with the Northern Alliance. The Northern Alliance controlled a small sliver of northeastern Afghanistan in the fall of 2001. It was the only unoccupied, unoccupied being the rest of the country to hold, held by the Taliban. Um, and so it was an enabled CIA, which had assets in the region and a capability to put people on the ground. As you said, 26 September, 2001, uh, our mission was to bring the Northern Alliance to our side completely, to pave the way for the introduction of what we assumed correctly to be a large US military entry, uh, and to also commence the hunt for uh, Al Qaeda and UBL and those responsible for the attacks on 9-11. I should say that on the 9th of September, uh, Ahmed Shah Massoud, the head of the Northern Alliance, was assassinated by Al Qaeda. And that was a galvanizing event that brought the Northern Alliance firmly, firmly into the U.S. Uh, fold. And that enabled us to, to bring in U.S. Army Special Forces. And let me say that uh, it was once a Green Beret many years ago, but it was the absolute perfect tool for the U.S. military to select. And working with, joined with CIA teams and U.S. military Special Forces Green Berets, about 300 people were able to ultimately defeat the Taliban along with superior U.S. air power within a period of about two months. So we're leaving a gap, but we'll revisit some of what happened in the intervening 20 years um, in, in, in the conversation to follow. Uh, but that was a helpful encapsulation of, I think, roughly 50 years and 10 minutes. So thank you very much. Um, Let's talk a little bit about today, current developments, starting with the decision to leave Afghanistan. Uh, I think each of you has previously publicly articulated a view that uh, some US presence would be necessary to keep the Taliban at bay. Um, this week, we heard top generals uh, testify that that was their personal view as well. Uh, we assume that was their recommendation to the president as well. 
to retain uh, at least 2,500 troops on the ground in Afghanistan while pursuing a negotiated agreement. So maybe we can just do a round robin and ask all three of you. Uh, I am curious when this sense of inevitability arose, at what point did it become clear to you that a Taliban takeover was unavoidable absent a US presence? Was there a particular moment or turning point when that became apparent? Um, why don't we start with Mike Vickers? Well, there was some hope that um, the Afghan government and the Afghan security forces that we had invested a lot in um, would be able to hold together but we should have learned from our experiences about the rapid collapse of Iraqi security forces in 2015 in Northern Iraq against ISIS, uh, and then Yemeni security forces that we'd also invested a lot in um, that same year against the Houthis who took over Yemen. You know, militaries can collapse really rapidly. And General McKenzie has testified that the Afghan government and much of Afghan security forces essentially saw the writing on the wall with the decision um, for the U.S. to actually withdraw, you know, beyond the um, peace agreement, or as H.R. McMaster has called it, the surrender agreement negotiated by the, the, the previous administration. Um, and so then they started making deals with the Taliban. You know, and the Taliban at first took over um, districts and provincial areas, but then it really um, um, sped up rapidly. And, and I think... Um, you know, the end game still went faster than, than people thought, but, I, but timelines kept moving up about how fast uh, it, uh, the, the government might collapse. So indications as far back as 2015. Uh, Michael Morell, what, what's, your, what's your view on this? Yeah, to, to answer your question, Olivia, you know, when, when did I believe that absent U.S. forces on the ground, the Taliban, you know, would would take over. When did I first realize that? You know, I have to tell you, it goes way back to the surge, to the Obama surge, um, when 130,000 U.S. troops um, were not able to win the war, when the Taliban fought 130,000 U.S. troops essentially to a stalemate. Um, you know, that told me that this war, you know, wasn't, wasn't winnable, number one. And number two, if we left, the Taliban would, would take over. Um, so, so, so that goes way back for me. You know, I agree with Mike on kind of the timeline um, this year. Um, but, the, but the realization to me that, that the Taliban would take over absent U.S. forces goes way back. Phil, which how do you why, think? Which is why we kept them there for so long, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I would have to agree with both both of my uh, colleagues. Uh, I, I thought without U.S. troop presence and U.S. air power to support the Afghans, uh, they would collapse. I did not think in, in the short period of time that they did, but I thought it was, in fact, I inevitable. And so when we made the decision, ultimately, that Trump made and then that President Biden then sort of doubled down on, we are leaving, zeroizing U.S. troop presence, I thought it would just be a matter of time. But again, I, I like it, everyone else, did not predict it as short as it was, but uh, it, uh, it, it was in inevitable. This is a little bit more of a policy question, but let's do a quick round robin on this one too. Um, and that's the Biden administration's rationale for leaving now. Um, you know, they've made they've they've argued that they were bound by the deal struck uh, by the Trump administration, uh, and that they risked an escalation with the Taliban if that withdrawal didn't happen by the end of August. Did you find that rationale coherent? Did you find it persuasive? Let's do it in the same order uh, with Mike Vickers first. Uh, no, I don't. I mean. Uh... You know, there aren't too many policy continuities between the Trump administration and Biden administration as there weren't between Obama, uh, the Obama administration and the Trump administration. Trump administration pulled out of the Iran deal. Biden administration wants to go back in. So why this is some special case, I don't know. Phil really hit the nail on the head in the sense the things that kept Afghanistan together were really U.S. assistance and engagement and, and then air power. You know, and as long as we uh, maintain U.S. air power, the Taliban couldn't win. You know, so Michael correctly 
raised the point that, you know, even with the surge, we couldn't defeat the Taliban. We actually pushed them back in terms of area they controlled back to about 2006 levels, uh, but we couldn't defeat them because of the Pakistan sanctuary. But, but the paradox of this is neither could the Taliban win when we had 7,500 or fewer troops in country from 2015 to 2021. It was only when we pulled out um, air power and signaled we were leaving that the state collapsed. Michael? So I have, you, you know, I hardly ever, 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 ever disagree with my really good friend, Mike Vickers, but um, I'm going to disagree just a little bit here. Um, I don't think the choice for President Biden was um, leave or stay with 2,500. I think the choice was leave or plus up. And I don't know exactly what the number was, um, but I think a plus up would have been required. 7,500, 10,000, I don't know what the right number is, but um, we needed, if we were gonna stay, we would need to add more troops in order to provide force protection for those 2,500 and for all the civilians in the country. 2,500 simply wasn't enough. And I think that President Biden judged correctly that that was not politically possible, that the American people were done with this war. Um, and could he have persuaded the American people that we needed to stay and to actually plus up our troops? I don't know, I doubt it. Um, clearly his heart wasn't in um, you know, such a, a, a public relations campaign. Um, so I think he did face an extraordinarily difficult decision um, and, you, you know, for my money, I think um, he probably made the right one given, given the choices he faced. Phil, you can choose a panelist to agree or disagree with. Uh, I'm going to uh, agree with uh, Mike Vickers. Uh, sorry, uh, Michael. Uh, no but I think this could have been done with 2,500, and that's based on conversations with some of the generals, most senior generals in, involved in this. Uh, bear in mind, too, 2,500 would be our figure. Uh, we have allies who are still there, still still putting up a fight. And there were other elements of the U.S. government actively, actively working the, the target sets. I think it could have could have held. Had the decision been made to maybe delay a bit, you probably could have negotiated that with the Taliban. And, and I've seen other people say it. Had they just pushed the departure into the winter months, it could have enabled some time gap separation between our departure potentially and the collapse that ensued. But to do it at the height of the fighting season with the Taliban in full vigor, uh, especially when that was being telegraphed to us with the collapse of all the provinces, uh, I think it just was, was, was uh, a bad decision. You know, um, Olivia, the other thing I would say here, um, which my co-panelists probably won't agree with either, is I don't think it's appropriate for a president of the United States to send young men and young women into harm's way um, with so much of the public opposed to the war. Um, I don't think that's fair um, to those soldiers to do that. And we're not talking about a, a you know, 60, 40, 55, 45, 60, 40 here. We're talking about a, a, a very large percentage of the American public that was just done with this thing. Michael, Phil, do you want to engage on that question, or should we? I, move on? I, I agree. I mean, you, you make a good point, Michael. I mean, the vast majority of the American public wanted out, wanted out even after what happened. Um, uh, the majority now also think it was done probably poorly or handled poorly, uh, the departure, but they're still overwhelmingly supportive of being gone. So to your point, that's right. The president had that going for him and was responding to the proponents of the American public. So I, you know, I agree with those points. I, I find it hard to believe knowing what has happened that people don't wish they could revise this decision a little bit. Um, you know, given the given the cost to America, um, and so we'll 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 just have to see over time. So, so let's talk a little bit about the intelligence that would have informed the policy decision to leave, and in what time frame that all should have been done. Um, 
both Phil and uh, Mike have said that it happened faster than uh, foreseen. We've heard that repeatedly from the administration and the Pentagon, including this week in testimony that there was no intelligence indicating Kabul would fall in 11 days. Secretary Austin uh, said it was a surprise and it would be dishonest to claim otherwise. Weeks ago, the DNI uh, also put out a statement saying that the Taliban takeover happened more quickly than anticipated, presumably within the IC. So does that suggest, and this is to you, Michael Morell, um, does that suggest that there was a shortcoming in the intelligence? Assuming that level of precision wasn't there, should it have been offered by the IC? Yeah, so this is a tough question, right? Because I haven't seen the intelligence. I haven't seen the intelligence analysis. I haven't seen what was both provided to the president before he made his decision um, on whether the Taliban would take over. And if so, how long would that take? Um, that's a very important judgment. Um, and I haven't seen um, the evolution of that judgment, you know, post, post announcement in April through through early August. So I don't know what the intelligence community said. Um, I find it hard to believe that the intelligence community got this as wrong as um, some people have said. I'd be shocked at that. Um, in fact, I've, you know, I don't, well, I haven't seen it. I've, I've heard people say, pe people who know say that uh, at least the CIA is, feels, feels pretty good um, about the judgments that it made. Um, you know, in terms of, in terms of the judgment that was made prior to the president's decision, um, I think one of the things you have to think about is, uh, let's say they said a year, right? Let's say they said six months. I don't know what they said, but let's, let's just say for the sake of argument, they said a year. The question becomes, when does the clock start ticking, right? When does that, that, that year start? Is it when the last boot leaves the ground? No. Is it when the, when the first boot leaves the ground? No, I think it's when the president made the decision because that's when the psychology changed for everybody um, in Afghanistan. It was the moment in, you know, when the president made the decision in April, it was the moment when the Taliban knew that it was gonna win. And it was the moment when the Afghan government knew that it was gonna lose. Um, and if you looked at what happened, right, in, in the immediate aftermath of that announcement, the Taliban accelerated the extent to which they were surrounding um, provincial capitals. Um, you know, nobody should be surprised with, with, with what they intended to do when they were surrounding those provincial capitals. The number of desertions among Afghan security forces skyrocketed after the announcement. They either went home or they flipped to the Taliban. And it should be no surprise to anybody that um, the Afghan, senior Afghan government leaders would start thinking about saving their own necks, right? And I saw the first two things publicly. Um, so that was no secret. Um, and I'd be shocked if the intelligence community didn't see the third one as well. So um, I think there's a little um, blame game going on here. Um, people are always very quick to throw the intelligence community under the bus. Um, the last point I would make, the last point I would make is, uh, you know, throughout the history of the 20 years, CIA was by far, by far the most pessimistic agency about how the war was going. We did um, two annual reports. We did an annual report called the district assessments, where we looked at who controlled which district. Um, whether the Taliban controlled it, whether the government controlled it, or, the, or whether it was contested. Um, and we also did an annual report on the, the, the Afghan security forces and um, their capabilities and will to fight. And we were always pessimistic in every single case. And in every case that I was involved in as a senior leader, both as the head of analysis at CIA and then as the deputy director, the United States military pushed back really hard on these assessments saying, you're, you're wrong, your analysts aren't on the ground, they don't understand the progress we're making. Um, so, you know, um, intelligence is being the whipping boy here, I'm almost certain. 
Mike, let me get your take on that. You know, so do you think it's it's fairly described as an intelligence failure? And then can you address a little bit of what Michael was just laying out, which is, you know, there, there was a fair amount of public messaging about this, that there was a divergence between what the CIA was saying, what the DIA assessments were about the resiliency of Afghan forces, uh, you know, the fact that CIA were routinely pessimistic by comparison. I mean, what, uh, how much would that or should that divergence of views have affected the choices that policymakers were making? So my friend Jim Clapper likes to say that there's only two conditions in life, uh, policy success and intelligence failure. And I don't see how one could call this an intelligence failure. You know, it, it, it you start with the knowledge that we're concerned about the durability. Now, the country might devolve into civil war. That was certainly a plausible scenario. But again, you have the examples of 2014 in both Iraq and Yemen about how quickly militaries we'd invested a lot could collapse. And it's not because of force ratios or anything else. But, you know, psychology is what really drives this and, uh, uh, you know, often and how our militaries break up. Um, and then, as Michael said, as you walk from April um, to August, um, we're on policy autopilot, but the world, you know, is not standing still for us. You have a bunch of events that are showing you that things may be much worse than you think, and you ought to be able to adapt to that. And then third, it's not possible for intelligence to tell you that Kabul's going to fall in 10 days. You know, so if you start escalating what could happen from, say, six months to 30 days, that's a big red light blinking for policymakers. And, you know, and policymakers live in a world of imperfect intelligence and they have to make decisions. And so uh, to lay the blame on this uh, on intelligence or for that matter on the Afghans, I think is honestly disingenuous. Olivia, can I just add one point? Um, this whole nobody told me that Kabul was going to fall in 11 days line um, is a total red herring, right? Um, it didn't fall in 11 days. Um, you know, it, it literally started falling after we reduced our forces um, after the surge. And it, you know, took a big upward tick in falling after President Trump made his deal with the Taliban and then took a bigger you know, leap forward and falling after President Biden made his announcement. So this didn't happen in 11 days. And, and, it, and, and, and people shouldn't be using that line, right? It's catchy, but it's just not accurate. Yeah, Olivia, if I could just say to the, um, uh, as a former chief of station in Afghanistan in 2008, 2009, Michael, you made a very good point. When those district assessments and those Afghan security assessments from CIA came out, you, you, I would be the face of it to the military and uh, you would take a lot of heat because oftentimes in a good natured way, but they, they were diametrically opposed in terms of their, their thoughts on the, on the readiness of, uh, of the Afghan security forces. I'll tell you the, the CIGAR reports, the Special Inspector General for Afghan Reconstruction reports, 51 of them were issued on a quarterly basis. And I uh, didn't read all of them, but I perused quite a few of them and very, very negative assessments, so scathing at times on, on sort of the, the, the readiness levels of the Afghan security forces. And that's over time. You, you would be hard pressed to find a cigar report that's positive. Now that may be the nature of inspector generals, but, but people saw this coming and knew this was happening and it was being reported in many channels. Can I just say one more thing, Olivia? Um, I'm probably screwing up your, uh, your time here, but this is um, important. I think this is important. Um, you know, I think the intelligence community is being blamed here because um, I think there was a real policy failure, not necessarily in the decision to leave, but in the um, effectuating that decision, right? In the implementation of that decision. Maybe we can talk about that next. But what I wanted, what I wanted to say was back in 2012, um, when President Obama was trying to figure out what his stay behind force number was going to be after the drawdown from the surge, and Mike will know how many deputies meetings and principals meetings and NSC meetings we had with the president on that. Um, it seemed to go on forever. Um, it, you know, I prepped, right, for every one of those. And in one of those prep sessions, I actually asked everybody in my office, all of the experts, the analysts and the operations officers, if we left, 
how long would it take for Kabul to fall? And, you know, various people, various people, um, you know, thought a little bit longer, um, you know, a year, year and a half. Um, some people had caveats on it. But the two people at CIA who had spent more time in Afghanistan than anybody else, um, two chiefs of station who had both served twice as chief of station, and Phil and Mike know who they are, they both said without hesitation, Kabul will fall in less than six months. And I remember taking that to the White House um, and putting that on the table way back in 2012. Well, then you're right. We need to abbreviate a little bit of what we were going to discuss, but uh, I think this is important um, context. And so why don't we do another quick round robin of um, how you would characterize all that's happened. I mean, so General Milley called the withdrawal from Afghanistan a logistical success and the war a strategic failure. Of course, the administration to include the president have cast it more positively uh, calling the withdrawal an extraordinary success. Um, so why don't we have each of you uh, describe, how would each of you describe this process? Sure, Mike Vickers, let's start. Um, so it is the strategic failure. I think, you know, uh, General Milley is not always very precise with his words, but uh, in this case, I think he was. And, um, you know, it's hard to call it anything but when your enemy for 20 years has taken over the country and is sitting in the capital. Um, uh, and so, uh, you know, I think that that, that that is an accurate statement. And so, and, you know, and it's a heroic logistical act. Um, uh, you could call it extraordinary, whatever you want you know, all the brilliant tactics and operations and logistics in the world don't make up for strategic failure. The consequences lie in, in, in what happens strategically. And so then the question is what happened, you know, certainly for me, it was very personal and seeing something I'd spent, you know, off and on 40 years of my life in, but this is the first, besides my own personal feelings, this is the first defeat America suffered in war since Vietnam. You know, so it's a gut punch to our country. And then there's strategic consequences about both for counterterrorism and what our uh, other adversaries think about this, about this display. You rest assured the Chinese and the Russians aren't calling this a great American success. Yeah. Um, why don't we go to Phil and then we'll go to Michael. Sure, I would characterize it as, uh, as, as Mike did, as a strategic uh, failure of significant proportions. Yes, the logistical efforts to pull people out were absolutely heroic. There's stories to be written and told eventually in the fullness of time. Those were official efforts by US military and other government agencies to pulling out many, many thousands. And there was an absolutely remarkable part of a, a sort of a gray effort of former soft operators and other uh, government officials, formers who got together and helped pull out hundreds if not thousands of other people. So this is a story that that's tremendous, but that's not a victory. The, the, it is a strategic failure. Today, tonight, the Minister of Interior in uh, 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 Afghanistan is Siraj Haqqani who has more American blood in his hands than anybody but Osama bin Laden. We killed Osama bin Laden. So the guy who has the most blood on his hands is Siraj Haqqani. He's the Minister of Interior. It's an abject failure. Michael? So I'm going to focus, you know, I agree that, that the war was a strategic failure, right? And we can talk forever about why that's the case. Um, but for me, the implementation of the decision to leave was not an extraordinary success. Um, yes, you know, once once it was obvious that we had taken way too long to begin to leave, um, it was a logistical success in terms of getting getting most folks out, but not all. Right? Let's not forget that. Um, um, it should have been the 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 withdrawal should have started much much sooner than it did. Um, I don't know what happened, um, but this took way too long. It got too crunched at the end. Thirteen Americans are dead. I find that very difficult to to call an extraordinary success. Those are pretty candid and harsh assessments. Um, I. 
agree that we could spend a lot of time uh, talking about this. I do want to shift a little bit into what is ahead, um, both in terms of the overall threat picture and what the architecture of the counterterrorism mission uh, will or should like uh, overall. Uh, I was going to start with Phil. Uh, I am going to assume, given what you just said, that you don't believe that we are dealing with a Taliban 2.0 or a changed Taliban. Um, I'm going to assume that you think that, uh, as General Milley put it, the enemy is in Kabul. Uh, there is some consideration being given to recognizing the Taliban as a legitimate government. What effect would that have? Yeah, I don't, I don't believe they've changed. Uh, I, and you're correct, uh, assuming that would be my position. Uh, no indications thus far. Again, with the, with the placement into uh, official positions of some of the people, including Haqqani that I just mentioned, uh, it's a deliberate poke at us and an indication that they're not serious. Akani is al-Qaeda related, uh, affiliated, and they're now in positions of, of power. I think the, the uh, al-Qaeda, ISIS, and other elements, it'll be too great of an opportunity, too great of a PR capability to not launch something from Afghanistan against us. And so I think that's going to be in, in the works. Yes, the Taliban wants recognition. Yes, they want foreign aid. Uh, they're going to have to change, it seems to me, mightily. I get uh, texts by the hour from former colleagues and military colleagues with some graphic uh, uh, atrocities being committed in Afghanistan as we speak. So uh, they haven't changed. Mike Vickers, maybe, maybe you can weigh in a little bit too. And I wonder if it's clear to you that the Taliban is even going to be able to consolidate and maintain power even at this early stage. I mean, even if we take at face value your commitment not to allow terror groups to reconstitute, which I'm not sure how many people do, um, will they, this you know, group of 70,000 different tri tribal factions, be able to control their own territory and the 40 million people who are residing on it to prevent that from happening? Uh, no, they're going to have great difficulty. Um, you know, not only will they have, you know, they have to worry about a, a civil war breaking out at some point, uh, it, you know, if the repression is, is too strong, and particularly in the non-Pashtun areas, uh, you know, of the north and and West, um, but they also, you know, Taliban strength is varied, you know, between 30,000 or so and maybe surging, you know, for brief periods of time to 60,000. Um, they're not gonna be able to pacify Afghanistan any more than we could with 150,000 troops and a lot better technology. And so groups like the Pakistani Taliban that use Afghanistan for sanctuary, we're talking about doing the same thing in Pakistan, and I would expect to see an uptick in violence there. Groups like ISIS-K that the Taliban is opposed to, isis Khorasan, the, the branch of ISIS that's in the Afghanistan-Pakistan region, um, they will um, enjoy some autonomy. The Taliban may go after them, but with some effect. But Phil hit on an important point. The big winner here is really Al-Qaeda you know, that we had largely defeated in the Afghanistan, Pakistan region. And they will not, there will be more foreign fighters going to Afghanistan and Al Qaeda with its strong ties to Siraj Haqqani and others, Pakistani Taliban among others, um, will be able to reconstitute. It may take them two years, typically does or more, but you know, our lessons again from 9-11 on, you know, after we defeated Al Qaeda and the Taliban in 2001, they were able to regroup in Afghanistan, Pakistan border region um, starting about 2004. Or so by 2006, we had the transatlantic airline plot that was on the scale of 9-11 and fortunately broken up by very good intelligence. Uh, right, M Michael, so Mike laid out just uh, a lot of what are very real concerns. I mean, Pentagon leadership this week said that they're not confident that the US is going to be able to deny either ISIS or Al Qaeda the ability to use uh, Afghanistan as a launch pad for terror attacks. Millie, I think, said that it could happen in as few as six months. So can you just talk us through a little bit, what are the key determinants of whether that happens and how fast that happens? Yeah, I just want to very quickly say that I agree that we're not dealing with a new Taliban, and I agree that they're going to provide safe haven to um, terrorist groups, most importantly, Al-Qaeda, and Al-Qaeda is intent on rebuilding its capability to attack the homeland, no doubt about it. And I agree 100% with Mike that um, that if they are allowed to do it, it will happen very quickly. Um, one of the things we've learned, um, um, as Mike said, is that terrorist groups um, are able to reconstitute very quickly when you take the pressure off of them. So, you know, I'd say six months to a year um, before they're in a position to attack us. 
Um, and that's pretty quick, right? So how do we prevent that? We, we would have to do, we would have to do two things. Um, we would have to have two capabilities and we would have to have um, um, one, political, one political factor. The two capabilities are number one, um, and a, a, a significant intelligence capability. And I break that into two pieces. The first piece is to collect intelligence on the plans, intentions, and capabilities of Al-Qaeda so that we know when they're getting to the point where they're posing again a, a significant threat to the US. And then the second type of intelligence is when they've reached that point, and when the president has made a decision that we need to degrade them, we need to provide the precision intelligence that the military is going to need to do their over the horizon attacks, right? Let's take drones, for example. Drones don't know where to go unless a specific piece of intelligence tells them where to go and look. Um, these are not broad search tools, right? Um, so you need that kind of intelligence capability right, um, both kinds. And then secondly, you need a military capability to reach in and touch, the, touch Al Qaeda and degrade them when you have to do that. Um, you know, Mike is, much, is in a much better position to talk about what those capabilities are than I am. Um, the, the, the third point I make is, is, this political, is this political thing, which is even if the intelligence communities identify that Al Qaeda is reconstituting and again posing a significant threat, and even if the military has the capability, whoever the president is has to have the political will in order to order that degradation, right? So those are the three things you need. Um, I'm not worried about our ability to figure out how to do the first two. I'm a little worried about where the resources are gonna to come to do that because we want to shift resources um, to, to you know, our strategic peer competitors, China and Russia, um, and we're gonna take them from CT. Well, I don't know if that's gonna work anymore. Um, so if we spend the resources and have the focus, I think we can do one and two. Um, three worries me a little bit given that, that I think most politicians wanna forget about Afghanistan. Um, so I worry that that a future president might be um, in a position where they're not willing to take action um, when they have to. So, Mike Vickers, I want to hear from you in the you know waning minutes that we have left because um, you know details are really really sparse on how the administration's over the horizon uh, strategy is going to work in Afghanistan. One thing we did learn from congressional testimony this week is that the U.S. still doesn't have any facing agreements uh, with any neighboring countries. Uh, we also now see the Taliban warning of unspecified consequences if the US continues to fly drones over its territory. They're citing the Doha agreement uh, uh, that the US says is binding as, you know, uh, as being in violation of that. China is endorsing that view. So if you were advising the administration on how this is, would work, you know, what would you say are the requirements for a successful predominantly, if not exclusively, over the horizon counterterrorism strategy in Afghanistan? So no one would choose, no, no counterterrorism strategist that I know would choose an over the horizon capability over a closer in or in country capability. And that's why I think this was such a strategically fraught decision to not have a small counterterrorism um, presence left in country. Uh, mostly special operators and intelligence personnel. Um, and the reason for that is, as Michael outlined, you know, this is mostly an intelligence war and your intelligence degrades as the further away you get. Also, the further away you get in flight time, particularly for instruments um, like drones, uh, which are slow flying aircraft, you spend an awful lot of time in transit rather than in target. So if we had to fly from the Persian Gulf, for example, um, which we have the capability of doing, it's hardly desirable from a, uh, uh, a time on target uh, point of view. So we won't be as effective as we otherwise would be by, by a long shot. You know, that said, uh, if we maintain an over the horizon capability, all our other over the horizon capabilities, again, which are really not by choice, they're dictated by circumstance, are much closer to their target areas than likely will be in Afghanistan. Um, 
if we maintain one, we'll still be better off than we were um, pre 9-11. And, if, and uh, under the conditions that Michael talked about, if we have the will to use it and everything else, it's still better than nothing, but it's, it's hardly as good as an in-country presence. Phil, I'd, I'd welcome your view on this too. I mean, I mean, so how how do you how is it done with no human network whatsoever, assuming there's none? Um, or you know, would the CIA have been able to construct something like a leave behind network uh, of human assets that uh, you know could function in a Taliban run Afghanistan? Uh, if so, would such a network you know have been able to survive the upheaval of these final weeks? Talk to us a little bit about um, what possibilities exist there. Sure, the, the human capability won't uh, uh, deteriorate immediately. It will deteriorate over time. But yes, there were capabilities left in place uh, that will be brought to bear. But again, they will attrit and, and eventually deteriorate over time. So without the boots on the ground, we got, I say we, US intelligence community and US military got very, very good at prosecuting uh, operations against senior Taliban and AQ figures because of the basing and boots on the ground. Again, that's all gone, of course, so that's not that's not going to be there. Some point that Michael made, I think, is a very good one. Will future administrations have the stomach to utilize these capabilities and, and pull the trigger when necessary? Not only pull the trigger, but realize mistakes are going to be made, like they were tragically several weeks ago in Kabul, this could happen again and they have to be prepared for that. That's one of the penalties or risks with over the horizon. You're not going to have the granularity that we had with, with human sources uh, on the ground. Yeah, let's let's briefly just talk about that strike because uh, so how does what the Pentagon said about how it was carried out sort of sit with you? I mean, General McKenzie said it was a self-defense strike based on an imminent threat uh, that that you know precluded the opportunity to develop pattern of life. You know, to what extent are those factors or non-factors when you're talking overall about over the horizon? Phil, feel free to jump in, and, and Mike thereafter. Well, I mean, I remember something. In fact, General Hayden said back when he was the director, "You want it bad, you get it bad." I think this was rushed. Uh, there was a real strong, understandable desire for, for retribution. And, and uh, unfortunately, the wrong dots were connected. Uh, there were the dissenting views, I understand, uh, from the press and the, in the community, perhaps, on this. But again, they were up against a, a clock and uh, decided to, to move. And tragic things like this can happen. Uh, but I would say, in my experience, it is extremely rare you aware when, when uh, any element of the USG does one of these kinetic operations. The military has made mistakes, it did so in this case, but that is very much a minority of these operations. Mike, if you'd like to add, feel free. Yeah, I, I, was, this strike was tragic, but it was also under very unusual circumstances for counterterrorism, you know, a real in extremist case. Normally, you develop targets over time. And in fact, what gives these operations their greatest precision is that, you know, you really have time usually to make sure that you're right. And so if you see that children go in the area or something, you wait till they leave. You may wait a month in some cases before you do a strike. And that's, that's the benefit of having real persistent presence is that you can get that kind of precision and wage a strategic campaign. You know, I would say our most successful counterterrorism campaign against Al Qaeda, um, because ISIS was like 2001, it was a mixture of Taliban and Al Qaeda, but was really in the Afghanistan Pakistan border region. And that's where we weren't over the horizon. That's where we were close in and we developed intelligence over years, you know, as Phil and Michael both know, and we were able to bring everything to bear. Let's talk a little bit about Pakistan. Um, in, and again, the just few minutes that we have left, I am assuming that each of you will have some thoughts um, about, um, about Pakistan, its relationship with the Taliban going forward. Um, so uh, Michael Morrell, why don't we start with you? you know, how, how do you see Pakistan's relationship with the Taliban? How do you see the relationship between our intelligence services and the ISI going forward? Um, let's just keep it broad there and then we can drill down if, if we can salvage the time. Sure, I think Pakistan is about ready to pay the price for their 20 year support of the Afghan Taliban. And the reason I say that is because the Pakistani Taliban 
which wants to overthrow the Pakistani state and, and routinely conducts attacks in Pakistan, used to be in Pakistan when there were a large number of US forces in Afghanistan where the Pakistani military could get at them. Now guess where they are? Now they're in, their, they're in Afghanistan. And now they're coming across the border into Pakistan to conduct attacks. They just did one a few weeks ago in Karachi, right? So the Pakistanis now face an enemy that they can't get at, right? Um, so I do think there's some mutual interest here. Um, you know, I think it would make sense for the United States, and maybe we've done this already, I don't know, but for the United States to go to the Pakistanis and not ask for basing rights, right? That's a little too quick. They're not politically able to do that at the moment, but say to them, let's work together on intelligence collection in Afghanistan. Um, we need to collect intelligence on, on Al Qaeda and ISIS. Um, you need to collect intelligence on the Pakistani Taliban and ISIS. So let's work together. Um, I think there's a mutual interest um, and you know, it could be kept secret. Um, I think we should make the pitch. Mike, I see you're rearing to go. Um, so, and it's an interesting idea. One of the, you know, probably the most unusual thing about our Afghan war since 2001 is not its duration, even though it's America's longest war. It's the fact that an ally of ours um, was really aiding our enemy for 20 years. And so we had both an ally and uh, someone aiding an enemy at the same time. Um, you know, and that's why we call them a frenemy, I suppose, you know, a new word we, we, we made up. Um, and I think Michael's right about potentially some common interest. I would add that Pakistani U.S. cooperation was best right after 9-11, and it lasted until about 2010, and then it, it really deteriorated, and it deteriorated actually before bin Laden. And we offered them all kinds of intelligence support in the border region when, as Michael said, the Pakistani Taliban were in Pakistan and killing lots of Pakistanis, and they wouldn't take it. They didn't want us to see um, their support for the Taliban, you know, waving them through the border and other things, which we saw anyway, um, et cetera. So they wouldn't take that cooperation. So while I'd like to believe that they would take it now, I'm pretty skeptical. Since 2010 and 11, they've been really thinking they're going to drive the U.S. out of Afghanistan and then they're turning to China. And that's what they've increasingly been doing. Mike, I'm just looking for any way to get close to Afghanistan with our intelligence assets. <laughs> well, me too. <laughs> Olivia, there was always a crazy, from my perspective, duality to the relationship with the Pakistanis and my colleagues have, have touched upon it. Uh, they house the Haqqani network. They house the uh, Quetta Shura. Um, yet they, they lost thousands of troops in the Fatah fighting different Taliban elements and at times prosecuting or assisting us in prosecuting very, very sensitive operations only to then publicly complain about them in, in the press. So it always was a real duality. But to the point of they, they may have bitten off more than they can swallow here, you know, just last week in the Red Mosque in, in uh, Islamabad was flying the Taliban flag. Now they ultimately had to take it down, but they may have uncorked something now. They may have a hard time uh, controlling. Uh, so I need to start going to some audience questions and thankfully some of them dovetail with uh, a few of the final questions that I had for you guys. Let's, um, let's talk about China, which seems to be the wild card here. Um, how do you see Beijing dealing with the Taliban and do you see a scenario in which China gets drawn farther into Afghanistan given how acute its concerns are with its own internal Muslim population? concerns that Al Qaeda or other groups could potentially inspire or connect with its own Uyghur population. Let's talk a little bit about China um, and we can start with you, Michael Morell. Actually, let's start with Mike Vickers because he was he was itching to talk about this earlier. Okay, Michael, Mike Vickers, let's, talk, let's start with you. Uh, so it's two, twofold, I think. One, what do they do about um, Afghanistan and Pakistan? Uh, you know, Chinese interest in Afghanistan had been very limited up to date. They've been basically economic and involving copper mines and, and other things like that. And so without real security being established, 
um, that will be difficult. And the Chinese are investing all over the world with their Belt and Road Initiative. So I'm not sure they're going to be so gung-ho. There's a corridor that connects Afghanistan um, to China called the Wakhan Corridor up in the very far northeast. Um, there's really not much there. Um, the uh, radical elements that aligned with Al Qaeda, radical Uyghur elements, uh, East Turkmenistan, uh, ETIP uh, is the acronym for the group, um, they're largely gone right now. Now, there may be a few, but the, the, they weren't that strong to begin with. So I don't think um, China faces as, as much a threat. One of the things we've seen with global jihadists, though, is that um, they make enemies everywhere. They're, you know, one of the laws of strategy is conservation of enemies. Don't make more than you need to. Um, Al Qaeda never learned that lesson. So whether it's India, Russia, Europe, the United States, you know, uh, Iran at times, uh, uh, Muslim governments that they consider apostate, um, you know, they have enemies all around. And so they they may well look at what China is doing in Xinjiang and decide uh, um, to conduct some operations there, and 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 then um, the Chinese may get more engaged. I think the bigger play for China is really in Pakistan, and that's where they'll they'll focus their attentions. I think Olivia, the only thing I would add, I agree with everything Mike said. The only thing I would add is, um, you know, geostrategically, this is a big win for China. Um, they can paint this as you know, an American military defeat, um, one of the most significant in history. Um, they can point to the, 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 the difficulty of the withdrawal and the debacle. And um, you know, it doesn't make the US look good on the world stage and they're, they are playing that up as we speak. Uh, let me take a couple of audience questions that uh, are very interested in recent reports, and this was raised in congressional testimony too, about uh, this, but the supposed offer by Russia um, to allow uh, Americans to base with them in Central Asian countries. Uh, should we entertain options to share bases with Russia in order to maintain capabilities in Afghanistan is the question from R. Isaac Baskins and Robert, Robert Gay had a similar question. Um, Phil, do you want to take that one? I think we should certainly look at the uh, opportunity, but I would be very, very skeptical given uh, Russian activities elsewhere in the world, even directed against the US, that they would be sincere in this area. But I think it, you'd have to pull the thread and determine if there's something there. I defer to my, my colleagues who have a big more strategic outlook on the Russians. You know, I'd say um, we should look at it, absolutely. Um, but I would be shocked if it didn't come at an extraordinarily high price in the form of um, sanctions relief um, for the Russians. Um, I think that's what Vladimir Putin would want in return. He would also want, if, if, if we put any strike capabilities um, at such a base, he would want um, strike approval, I'm sure, um, which, which would not be acceptable to us. So should we look at it? Yes, um, I, but, I, but I share um, Phil's skepticism. Mike, do you wanna weigh in? Um, yeah, no, I, I, I agree on that. You know, I mean, Uzbekistan and, and Tajikistan gets you a lot closer. You do have some weather issues with that, but the price would likely be too high. And, and uh, for reasons both uh, Phil and Michael said, and particularly strike approval, uh, releasing sanctions and other things. But also, you know, we have failed to deter Russia in many ways since 2014. I mean, they're not our friends right now. Um, here is a question from somebody named Jake Sullivan, although I'm told it is very likely not that Jake Sullivan. Um, <laughs> while Presidents Trump and Biden were responding to public opinion in, uh, in ending the war in Afghanistan, ought they have? Should our allies have to worry about relatively quick turnarounds in public opinion to guide our military commitments? So my view, right, um, is that presidents shouldn't respond to public opinion. My view is that presidents should shape public opinion with the facts, of course, not, not with anything else, but um, a president should decide what's in the best interest of the United States and then convince the American people that he or she is right. That's the job of a president. Um, just an unsolicited view. Go ahead, Mike. 
Um, yeah, so I agree. Presidents are supposed to lead, um, not follow. And, uh, you know, I also think that in casting this as a largely as a failed nation building exercise, which it was an internal war in Afghanistan that we could leave, um, it was really the wrong way to cast this. I mean, it really is all about counterterrorism. The thing we care about in Afghanistan is not to get not to get hit from there again. And um, the war with global jihadists is going on. And so why we would give up prime real estate uh, in that war and increase our risk at the notion of ending some forever war, you know, the, the, that part of the war is still going on. So I just think it was miscast politically and a missed opportunity to leave. Here's one that maybe all three of you can weigh in on uh, from someone who's anonymous. Can you see the U.S. returning to Afghanistan like we returned to Iraq? I, I, I can. I, I'd be honest with you. If, if an attack came of a magnitude of 9-11, and I'll suggest it would, we would go back there in a heartbeat. And with the same vigor. Now, what are we going to do with the same format? I, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't think, by the way, this is likely, but uh, there are circumstances where we, we would have to go back in there. Uh, maybe with a smaller footprint. Now we, that we know the terrain, we know the country, we wouldn't have to go with 130,000 troops. But uh, you very well could see uh, U.S. forces have to go back and, uh, and take care of some issues. Yeah, I would agree with that. Just a, a, a much smaller footprint, right? Because we've learned now um, how to do this I think in a way that 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 we didn't at the very beginning. So, um, yeah, we I could absolutely see it. Um, so just one uh, elaboration. You know, the ISIS analogy is probably not the best one. It's more 9/11 because we did respond to ISIS in time uh, in Iraq. We failed to do that in Afghanistan. You know, so ISIS took over half the country. And then we and the Iranians uh, responded and stopped them at the gates of Baghdad and then eventually kicked them out of Iraq and then, and then out of Syria. Um, the Taliban now have the control over all of, of, of Afghanistan, at least nominally. And so that train has left the station. As Phil said, if you have a, another major attack, we will, you know, we will be forced to do something. Now, presidents always have choices of, as they did on 9-11, whether to just use air power, use a big invasion, or use what we did, which was the right course. And I think, you know, what we've learned from 20 years of war is that course we started on in Afghanistan in, in 2001, and how we've prosecuted the war against Al-Qaeda and ISIS is the right way to fight in what is unfortunately a very, very long war. You know, the, the more you raise your commitments to it with narrow ends, the more you're going to fail in a democracy at the end of the day. And Olivia, I would just add that the precedent of the question is really interesting, right? Because um, what happened in Iraq was we left and Al Qaeda in Iraq, which would eventually become ISIS, was free to expand. And it did so dramatically without a US military presence there. Um, and military support for the Iraqi effort against Al Qaeda in Iraq. So um, I don't think ISIS would have ever um, become what it became if US, if the United States had never withdrawn from Iraq at the end of 2011. Here's one that we probably start with with Phil um, asking about. What's your position on uh, providing support to two still resistant fighters, including Masoud's son, um, to, I don't know if it would be to this end, but to start a civil war in Afghanistan as advocated by some members in Congress? Yeah, I, I, I would actually support that. I, I realize I'm probably in a pretty small minority. Uh, uh, Amarullah Saleh is, is one of the two leading uh, leaders of the resistance. Uh, he was a friend of mine. He ran the intelligence service. He served as my interpreter in 2001. He was the vice president of Afghanistan six weeks ago. Um, hopefully he's alive in a neighboring country and, and, and preparing for some sort of uh, uh, counterattack. Um, ditto Masood's son. 
Um, there are plenty of elements in that country that want to resist the Taliban, and I would hope that we potentially aid them. I, again, I don't see that happening. We've, we've cut an agreement, and it looks like we may try to work with this government. But uh, I will tell you, I've talked to other former allies, former soldiers. There's a whole bunch of people out there that want to see support to this, these elements. Uh, whether it happens uh, remains to be seen. Did Michael, Mike and Michaels want to weigh in on that question? Yeah, it would be very difficult because one of the things you want to do with uh, support for a resistance movement, I mean, one, it always helps to have one rather than try to create one, you know, as we've learned from many, many decades of experience, uh, going back to my days in the 80s, Central America versus Afghanistan. Um, but in this case, we don't really have a friendly state. You know, in the 1980s, we had Pakistan. Uh, 2001, we had, you know, Uzbekistan and uh, uh, Tajikistan and, uh, and Pakistan and a weakened Russia, uh, none of those conditions apply right now. So we would have to create internal space in Northern Afghanistan uh, for them, which would mean a very, very different approach, probably more aggressive use of US air power to create an enclave. And then, you know, it only works if you really have something, you can either catalyze an insurgency or you have something to work with in the first place. And then as Phil said, I just don't think there's the appetite for this. Let me ask, there's elements of, of an audience question in this one. Uh, you know, it's early, there's a lot of soul searching to be done, um, but, but right now in your minds, what are some of the key lessons that we should be taking away from the past two decades of our engagement in Afghanistan? You know, maybe one way to think about respond, maybe responding to Secretary Austin, who said, we helped build a state, but we could not forge a nation. Um, Michael, do you want to start with that? Gosh, there, there are so many, right? Um, there are many, 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 many. Um, I think the first is um, American hubris. Um, you, you know, I think that, that at the end of the day, that it was impossible um, to change a tribal, um, decentralized uh, society, feudal almost society into a, a liberal democracy with a central government. Um, you know, nobody asked in 2002 when, when that became the goal for good reasons, right? Believing that, that if you could do that, um, you could eliminate extremism from Afghanistan. Um, so it wasn't, it, you know, it wasn't done without thought, but nobody ever asked the question, is this possible, right? You know, the answer to your question about should we support the resistance against the Taliban, um, you have to ask the question, is it possible for the resistance to win? And I don't think it is. Um, and we never asked that question way back in, in, in 2002. So that's, that's one lesson is you gotta, you gotta, you have, your goals have to be realistic and achievable. Um, and I'm not sure they were here, um, but that's just one of so many mistakes we made. And let's, let's cap it so that we, we can let um, Phil and, and Mike offer something too. Phil, do you wanna go and then we'll go to Mike? Yeah, I think uh, uh, I agree with everything Michael said so hard to, to, to build a nation. One thing that I felt every time I went to Afghanistan, both in the commercial capacity and then when I was working for the government on many occasions, a lot of time there was the sort of the duality. You had State Department, and I'm make, make, simplifying something very complex, concerned about corruption and other aspects of governance. You had a military correctly concerned with force protection and prosecuting operations. And you had an intelligence community really focusing on counterterrorism. And so, all the government organs would, would never, in my mind, fully united to do what, it, what needed to be done. I'm not saying it was even possible were we well united, but I never really felt that way. And I was there in 08 and 09 when prov provincial reconstruction teams were out in, in full vigor, and I never got the sense that we were on the right track to create something. Uh, we never got our arms around uh, corruption, and it ultimately uh, helped doom uh, the, the, the Afghan government. Because uh, to my surprise, the Afghan troops weren't being paid. I knew the Ministry of Interior and the police never got paid in the last 20 years, or rarely did, but the military, once that was cut off, it, it doomed them, and they were not going to uh, resist. So anyway, uh, nation building, for want of a better term, we're not very good at it, and we weren't good at it over 20 years. 
Mike, you'll you'll have the last word before uh, Larry closes us out here. So over to you. Uh, so mission creep and not staying focused on your central achievable objective, which is the counterterrorism one, not to get hit from Afghanistan again, uh, is probably the most important thing uh, lesson. We, you know, we made lots of mistakes. You know, failure has a thousand fathers uh, in this case. Um, but I would say the biggest lesson in the end game uh, is, is really that, um, you know, you can talk all you want about ending wars, but wars are won or lost. You know, they're, they're ended because they're won or lost usually, and sometimes with political negotiations. And as bad as stalemate is, and it's a condition of the Pakistani insurgency and perfect terrain for guerrilla warfare and Afghan corruption and lots of other reasons, um, stalemate is better than defeat. You know, and if there's one lesson to learn, it's that be careful when you choose defeat. Um, and particularly when an insurgency is intertwined with global terrorism, that raises the stakes higher than it would uh, in another in civil war that we might disengage in. And I would, you know, I would add, if you look at our uh, support for the Colombian government, that's been going on nearly 50 years, much smaller commitment, much wiser course of action in some ways. I'm glad nobody's calling that the forever war. I'm glad they didn't call it that in 19 and 2000 when the FARC, uh, the, the uh, uh, guerrilla movement in Colombia, primary one, that uh, was at the gates of Bogota, because we'd have a very different outcome there today had we not done what we did. Careful when you choose defeat. Um, gentlemen, thank you so much um, for engaging tonight, for your expertise, for your insights. Uh, I'll hand it back over to Larry. Thank you. Olivia, thank you for a wonderful job moderating. You brought up a lot of the a lot of the key issues. You, you crammed a lot into a little bit of time and you did a wonderful job distilling lots of great questions from the audience uh, and drilling in on, I think, some of the more important questions they had. Thank you to the audience who uh, stuck with us through the whole event. Uh, fascinating discussion, sobering at times. And uh, uh, thank you to our panel members for bringing years of experience and knowledge about this problem set uh, to our audience today. I think everybody uh, leaves uh, much more well-informed and uh, a little more cognizant of the gray area nuance that uh, takes place. Uh, General Hayden, any final remark? Well, one, one thought, I think we'll get coming back sooner or later. <laughs> Sobering. <laughs> yes, indeed. Over to you, Mark. All right, thank you, Larry. Thank you, General Hayden. And thank you, Olivia and panelists for, again, it really was a fascinating and sobering discussion. Uh, I learned a lot tonight. I know our audience of over 300, both on Zoom and YouTube, who stayed with us through the whole program. I think there might've been a baseball game on that some people were interested in, uh, but they decided to feed the mind and prioritize um, this discussion. So I, I appreciate everybody who participated and attended this program. And let me close it out by saying, welcome back to the Hayden Center events. Uh, we're gonna have many more coming up this uh, academic calendar year. So look out for the Hayden Center website at the Shar School of Policy and Government, George Mason University for upcoming events and hope to see you soon. Thank you and good night, everybody. <laughs>